Hello, thank you for joining with us for our online Bible study. I trust that the Lord will bless you as you have this time together with us. Let's just pause for a moment to pray and commit this time into our Lord's hands. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful that we're able to once again gather together to study your word. We pray, Lord, that uh, as did pray the psalmist of old, Lord, that you'd open our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things uh, out of thy law. We're thankful, Father, for the study on the names of God, and we're thankful for the wonderful way in which you're pleased to reveal yourself to us by. And so we pray you bless our study tonight, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The names we've seen so far has been uh, the name God, uh, which is uh, Elohim. Uh, We've seen that in Genesis and then throughout the Bible. Uh, We've seen God reveal himself to us as Jehovah, that's capital L. O-R-D, and we've also seen him reveal himself to us as Almighty God, which is the Hebrew El Shaddai. Last week we looked at the uh, word Lord again, uh, capital L and then lowercase O-R-D, and that is Adonai, and it emphasizes the fact that he is our master. Over the next several weeks we'll be looking at some of the compound names of Jehovah, And these names are wonderfully uh, descriptive of our God. So generally what this does is it takes the name Jehovah. Now remember that Jehovah is is the name that God revealed himself by to Moses. And uh, it tells us that he is a self-existent one. And it's the personal name of God. And so we have this name that God has given to himself, Jehovah. And then... Uh, added to that we have these compound names and generally they are names that have been uh, that man has given to God because of a a way in which he has revealed himself to them and so we have these compound names and so the the name that we're looking at tonight is the name Jehovah Jireh and it's a wonderful name in the word of God we uh, find it actually only in one place so it's quite unique And the place that we find it is in the book of Genesis and chapter number 22. So I'd like you to turn there if you would. Genesis chapter 22, we're going to be reading together from verse number 1 down to verse number 14. So Genesis chapter 22, reading together from verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abram his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abram said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught 
in a thicket by his horns. And Abram went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now we see in this passage that God puts Abraham to the test. And that is literally what verse 1 means. We think of tempt in a negative way, as in to tempt somebody to sin. But of course it's impossible for God to do this. He is light, in him is no darkness at all. And so the Bible tells us, actually in the book of James, it tells us quite emphatically, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot tempt, uh, be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So God doesn't tempt us to sin. But as we see in the text, that they, the, the, the uh, way that the Bible puts forward this particular narrative to us, is that God is putting Abraham to the test. And of course, as we read through it, we are encouraged by the fact that he passed the test with flying colors. Now, this particular test that Abraham had to face, there were two aspects to it. There was firstly, there was a, a private and personal aspect to this, to this test. And then we can also see that there was a public and powerful aspect to this test as well. And so tonight, as we look at this particular story in the Word of God, we want to highlight three different things. Firstly, we want to see the, the event as it takes place. Then we see the lesson that we can learn. And thirdly, the application that we can apply. So let's consider firstly the event as it took place. As I said, this was a, a, a test that was intensely personal and private uh, for Abraham. It was a test of his faith, his personal faith. It was a test of his faith. It would be his greatest trial. It would be his greatest step of faith. It was a trial of great sacrifice. Now, Abraham throughout his life had learned that there would be many sacrifices that he would make. But this was a sacrifice like no other. God had called upon him to yield up the life of his son on the altar of sacrifice. So just think about this. As a father, it is unthinkable that you would take your son and you would lay your son out and, and kill your son in such a, a fashion. As fathers, we would think rather, I would take his place. I, will, I would rather die for my son than to see harm come to him. To place your own son upon an altar would be an unthinkable thing. Uh, but we read in verse 2 quite clearly, God says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. Now, Isaac is termed here as God's, as um, Abraham's only son, I think for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Ishmael would have long ago departed, so he was no longer in the household. God did say that of Ishmael he would make of him a great nation, but he was no longer in the household. And of course the promises of God weren't bound up in, in Ishmael. And so I think the, 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 the second important thing that we can see from this is that the promises to, that God made to Abraham, this, this covenant that God gave to Abraham, is clearly bound up in, in the, the life of Isaac and in the children that Isaac would have. And, and this comes very important for us in a moment's time. But just for the moment, just think to yourself that for Abraham, as he looked upon his son Isaac, all of the promises were bound up in the life of this lad. All of the promises that God had given to him. So Isaac was dearer than life to Abraham. And then also think of Isaac and 
you shouldn't be thinking that he's a, a small little child at this time. Uh, very clearly, uh, here's a, a young lad that is able to speak and reason with his father. In verse 7, we read Isaac saying, Behold, here's the fire, here's the wood, where's the lamb? For a burnt offering. So this is an, an older child definitely because he is speaking and reasoning with his father. And then also we see that Isaac is uh, carrying the wood uh, in verse 5. So he's strong enough to walk up the mountain and carry the wood as well. So the Bible doesn't give us a specific age. But I think he would be in his late teens at this particular time of his life. Actually this whole trial also speaks quite highly not just of Abraham but of Isaac as well because we see his submission and we see his trust of his father we, we don't read of a single protest and we don't read of a struggle that he had and undoubtedly he could have protested and struggled so that his father could not bound him and put him on the altar but we don't read of that so he submitted himself willingly there's a wonderful picture and lesson in that as well. So Abraham takes his son, he binds him up, puts him upon the altar, and he takes his knife and is intended to go through with the sacrifice. So you can see quite how personal and how private this particular trial was because nobody could enter into what Abraham was going through at this particular time. This was something that God had intended for Abraham and for Abraham alone. But it also speaks of something that was very public and very powerful as well. Because as we look at these events, we can see clearly that this is speaking of something far greater than what is happening on Mount Moriah. This is a, a preview, if you like, of a great and eternal truth. So this chapter actually takes us beyond these events, if you like. There's a, in verse 8, we read Abraham replying to Isaac, where Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And all of these events as they take place, they, they point so wonderfully uh, to Calvary. And they picture so wonderfully the Lord Jesus Christ. So with this event that took place, while it was private and personal, it is public and powerful because it is portraying and picturing a wonderful event that was going to take place sometime in the future. Now Mount Moriah is believed to be the very place where Solomon would first erect the temple. Here it is the place where lambs would have been taken and slain. And surely the answer to, Abraham, to Isaac's uh, question, where is the lamb for the sacrifice, would come more definitively thousands of years later when Jesus Christ would be coming to approach John the Baptist and John the Baptist would cry out and say, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So this event, however tragic it was for Abraham, it pictures for us a more heart-rending and more solemn event that would take place later on Golgotha. If we read this particular story and recoil in horror as we think of a father taking his son to sacrifice his son upon an altar thinking this is cruel and this is very unkind we need to remind ourselves that this is picturing a far greater sacrifice where God would give his own son to die on a cruel cross for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life you know when God gave his son he did not stay his hand the sacrifice was carried out to the full in this past week in our Bible reading if you're reading through the Bible in a year you'll have 
started reading in the book of Leviticus. And as you read through the book of Leviticus, you see as to how the sacrifices and the offerings are explained and detailed out very carefully for us. And I was thinking to myself as I'm reading through that, that um, there would be some people that would be somewhat disturbed by reading as to the graphic way in which the animals were to be taken and slaughtered and placed upon an altar. And I thought to myself, there's no telling what a vegetarian or even a vegan would think if they were to read that. But I wonder what would the same person think if they read of Calvary? If they read about Jesus being our substitute? If they read of him being so beaten so badly where the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 50 verse 16 it says I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair I hid not my face from shame and spitting and in chapter 52 the Bible says that his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men no doubt when you read the gospel accounts of what had taken place you need to be mindful of the fact that what you have before you when you read about Christ being taken and scourged and then beaten and taken and nailed to a, a cruel cross you have a most gruesome and a most bloody scene before you sometimes we have when we think of Calvary a somewhat of a sanitized view in our mind's eye but make no mistake, dear believer, it was a horrible scene to behold. Isaiah goes on to say in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was, bru he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You see, there upon that cruel cross on Golgotha, his bruised and bloody but sinless body was there as our substitute. And as Abram was taking the knife to plunge it into the chest of his son, as he was thinking about this great sacrifice that he was going to make, undoubtedly, as he thought about it, this is how he reasoned. Now, remember I said to you that the uh, covenant promises that had been made to Abraham were bound up in his son. And, and Isaac at this time was unmarried and without any children. Abraham reasoned that even, even if he was to take the knife and plunge it deep into Isaac's chest, and Isaac would die as a sacrifice upon that altar. He believed that in order for God to be true to his word, that he would raise Isaac from the dead. He believed this. So while there was a great horror of darkness upon Abraham as he would have left the two men at the foot of the mountain and, and walk up the mountain with his son, with the view of sacrificing his son, he believed that God would raise him from the dead. In fact, that's what he said to the young men. He said, we're going yonder and worship and we will come back again. So he, he testified of the faith that even though he was to do the unthinkable, that God would do the impossible, that God would raise him from the dead. And we know that this is how he reasoned because this is what we read in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. In that great hall of faith, if you, like, if you like to turn there, in Hebrews chapter 11, you have recorded for you there all the wonderful exploits of faith of the men and women of old. Abraham, of course, is included in that great list. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, we read, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, 
from whence also he received him in a figure. So Abraham believed that God would raise his son, even if it was to kill him. So these are the events as we find them. Secondly, there's a lesson for us to learn. Now, of course, when we read this, we're not kept in suspense as Abraham was because we know what God was going to do. We read and we, we know that God was going to stay the hand of, of Abraham. It's something we are familiar with. We've read it a, a number of times. And we know that God was supplying a ram in a thicket to take the place of Isaac. But Abraham didn't know this. He was just believing God. He was trusting God to do what would be impossible. So Abraham was faithfully doing what God told him to do. But Abraham didn't get to finish the test because before the knife would fall, God stayed his hand and stopped him in time. Isaac was not to lose his life. You know, the only sacrifice that God has ever demanded, or human sacrifice, may I say more properly, the only human sacrifice that God has ever demanded has been the sacrifice of his own dear son. Abraham lived in a time where it wasn't uncommon for people to sacrifice their small children to Moloch. But God has never demanded it. We would sacrifice our children in such a way. We don't die for him. He's died for us. There is a fundamental difference between Christianity and religion. Religion demands that you do something. Some even demand that you would lose your life. In Christ, he's done it all for us. He doesn't say, come die for me. He says, I want you to live for me. And so there's a, a remarkable difference between religion and true Christianity. Now, of course, we know that it may well be that you are, have to go through a time of great trial and persecution, and many believers have lost their lives because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They love not their lives even unto the death. They are faithful and true to the word of God. But we don't lose our life, or we don't give our lives in order to be saved or to gain God's approval. We already have it in our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So we see that God provided a ram. And of course, this ram in the thicket is a wonderful picture. It, over, uh, it foreshadows uh, the supply of God's own dear son to go to the cross for us. And this provision of God greatly impressed Abraham. Now, Abraham had grown accustomed to God revealing something about himself. God, God revealed various things to Abraham. He knew God as Adonai Elohim, as Lord God. He knew that he was almighty. He was the possessor of heaven and earth. But now he learned something more. And this is true of us. If we are obedient to God, we learn more and more about him. Here Abraham learns that Jehovah provides. And particularly that Jehovah provides a substitute to sacrifice instead of Isaac. This is why we have the name, this compound name, Jehovah Jireh. And this compound name, Jehovah Jireh, is perhaps the more well-known and uh, more interesting of the compound names. Now, as I've said, it's quite a unique name. Uh, we could argue that it's not so much a name as what it is a place. Because we read in verse 14 that Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said today in, uh, in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. So it was called that, that place was called that because of God's great provision, Jehovah Jireh, God provided. God could see the distress of his son, uh, of Abraham, I beg your pardon. God could see the distress of Abraham um, going to sacrifice his son. And God sees whatever you and I are going through and God provides. 
Jehovah Jireh. God always provides. In verse 8, Abraham had said, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And in verse 14, he, we read, he says, In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. The it there is referring to the provision of God. And so Abraham learns, and we should learn this too, that God has provided, and so he is to be provided, uh, to be trusted to provide even more. So Abraham has learned that Jehovah Jireh had provided, he saw and he provided, and then in verse 14 he says, it shall be seen. And so there is a forward looking here, and he's trusting that God will continue to provide. In the mount of the Lord, it, the provision will be made and seen. And you think about it, whatever your it may be, whatever your need may be, understand this, dear believer, that God is able to provide it. You'll see it. God sees it. He sees your need and is able to wonderfully give to you. In 1 Thessalonians we read, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. The provision will be seen. So that's a lesson we learn. And then the third thing that I'd like you to think about is there is an application for us to apply. Because Abraham was sorely tested and tried. It was the ultimate uh, test of his faith. Humanly speaking, all was lost. Uh, but in this very severe trial, Abraham received a new revelation about God. That God is a God that provides. Jehovah Jireh. Now you think about this name, Jehovah Jireh. It is a name that comes to us from an ancient world. It comes to us from thousands and thousands of years ago. But it's still true. That what was true of God back then in Genesis 22 is true of God today. He's immutable. He, he cannot change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what Abraham was able to understand and learn about God, about him being Jehovah Jireh, we we're able to apply that to our lives as well. He is still Jehovah Jireh even today. In Philippians 4 verse 19, Paul said, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All your need. In Romans we read in chapter 8 and verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Jehovah Jireh. You think... Of this wonderful phrase you know we shouldn't think of God as the God who has only who has provided in the past we should be mindful of the one who is providing for us even now and will continue to do so Abraham was taking the truth and he was applying the fact that God was going to continue to provide and we can and we, we really should be doing the same thing we need to take this to heart and when you think back at Calvary, it's a constant reminder of this. Because Romans 8, as I said, it's in verse 32, it is telling us that God has provided for the greatest need that we ever could have. He, he provided for the eternal salvation of your soul. And having taken care for this greatest need, you can uh, rely upon and trust in this wonderful fact that you'll take care of your lesser needs as well. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how ah, shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And the all things are the things that we are going through today. Having provided for the greatest of things, God now provides for good things for you and I. And there's no limit to what God is able to do and what God is able to provide. Because again, in Philippians chapter 4, the Bible says that uh, Paul is saying that God is able to provide 
or supply our need according to his riches. According to his riches. And of course we can, we can think about that and realize that the, the bank of heaven is never under dire financial straits. God can do whatsoever he wills. And so we're able to quite literally take that to our bank and say, realize that God is able to provide. He has provided and he will continue to provide. He is our Jehovah Jireh. May the Lord bless these thoughts to your heart. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we're thankful that uh, you love us and we're thankful, Father, for the wonderful way in which you provide for us. We're thankful, Lord, for Calvary. We're thankful for the wonderful provision of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now, Lord, we are reminded of the fact that uh, you continue to be our Jehovah Jireh and whatever our need may be, whatever our it may be, we're thankful, Father, that you're able to continue to see and provide for our every need. Father, we're thankful that you are our Jehovah Jireh. Help us, we pray, just to take you at your word and to trust you. As your name says, Jehovah will provide. We thank you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. and We look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday here at church. God bless you. Goodbye.